Desiree's family says that there were signs that were overlooked by the state of Vermont and indications that Desiree was not safe a year before her stepfather allegedly killed her. Desiree's mother was convicted of abusing her daughter. Tonight, Desiree's family says she never should have been there and DCF made a deadly mistake. What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! A rally in downtown Rutland, a change.org petition signed by thousands of people, a Facebook page filled with comments from around the country. The demands for better came roaring in. Justice! That was months ago now. And this is one of the last pictures that I had with her. Things are quieter at Patty Holden's home. The outrage muffled by grief and regret. And I just told her, you can't hurt no more. Nobody's going to ever hurt you. And I felt like I failed. And I know it wasn't me, it was DCF. Those were Patty's last words to her niece. This is her little teacup. Although from all the pictures and the way Patty talks about her, Desiree. you would think two-year-old Desiree Sheldon was her own daughter. Say, Patty! Play! <laughs> and for a while, Good girl. it seemed like she was. These right here are the last things that we got of Desiree. Her um, handprints from the hospital. And this is me. This is her Uncle Adam. Patty and her husband took Desiree in for seven months. Everybody just fell in love with her the moment you met her. DCF put Desiree in their care. That's because in February of 2013, Patty's sister-in-law and Desiree's mom, Sandra Eastman Doobie, brought her here to the emergency room at Rutland Regional. Desiree had not one, but two broken legs. It was just four days before her first birthday. We had a lot of her first. We threw her first birthday party. <laughs> so booby, you know. My husband taught her to walk. Those are memories that nobody else has, and we get to keep those. According to the documents charging Sandra with child abuse obtained by WPTZ, doctors believe the fractures happened at different times. And Sandra told them she has no explanation for the injury or why it took so long to get medical treatment. She later told investigators inconsistent stories about how the injuries happened and eventually pleaded guilty. How can you not know your baby's in pain? Desiree must have shown symptoms. And as a mom, how could you not notice that? Last fall, Patty says DCF caseworkers told her Desiree was going back home to live with her mother and her stepfather, Dennis Doobie. The man authorities would charge with her death just four months later. In the court documents detailing that murder charge, doctors said, quote, it appeared that someone held her head so tight, her skull was cracked. It's very heartbreaking. Patty never felt good about Desiree going back home. She and her husband went so far as to talk to a lawyer about adopting her. And I was afraid that something else was going to happen, and it did. Keep in mind, before DCF puts an abused child back with a the family, there are multiple meetings with the parents and that child in question. Outside experts might weigh in, and parents may even receive counseling. Ultimately, though, it's a judge who reviews DCF's findings and determines if it's safe for a child to go home. But Desiree's subsequent death raises questions about how thorough those reports actually are. We all want to protect children, but we all want to be right. We want justice to prevail. And that's, that's easier said than done. No one from DCF, including its commissioner, Dave Iacovoni, can talk specifics about Desiree's case because of ongoing criminal and internal investigations. But he did say this. When the incident occurred, I quickly wanted to meet with the family because I felt I owed it to them to look them in the face and tell them how sorry I was for their pain and that I was committed to doing my very best to find out what happened and why. Still, Desiree's Aunt Patty yep. wonders how she could see the signs. The last time that I saw Desiree was at her birthday party. She kept hugging on to me and something inside told me that something wasn't right. And the state of Vermont did not. I don't think it's right because it's not like the child could say who did this to them. We're supposed to be their voice. They're supposed to help them. Dennis Doobie pleaded not guilty. His next court appearance is set for Monday. As for Sandra Eastman Doobie, she declined multiple requests to be interviewed. Well, this is something that we've spent months investigating and researching. Several records requests and multiple interviews later, we have a clearer view of how the Department of Children and Families works in Vermont and what many say are the agency's shortcomings. I was attached from the day she was born. Desiree Sheldon's aunt, Patty Holden, will never forget her last words to her niece. I just told her you can't hurt no more. A little more than a year before Desiree was killed, she was also at the hospital, that time with two broken legs. Her mother, Sandra Eastman Doobie, was convicted of child cruelty. But after an investigation, DCF allowed Desiree to return home with her mom and stepdad. Now I feel like maybe we could have saved her, but we'll never know now. Sadly, there have been other repeated abuse cases besides Desiree's. Another young girl who has never been identified was abused by her adoptive mom, Lori Davenport. In court documents charging Davenport with numerous counts of abuse,
The 11-year-old said she forced her to take hot baths, hit her with a belt and wood, and intentionally burned her hands with a curling iron and hot cookie pan. Davenport was convicted of abusing that same child two years before. She pleaded no contest to four of those most recent charges and is now serving prison time. That was nearly three years before Desiree died. We all could be doing something better. and This is an opportunity to, to really try and do better by Vermont's children. We asked Jennifer Pullman, the executive director of the Vermont Children's Alliance, about a Vermont law governing DCF that lists one of the agency's purposes as this, to preserve the family and to separate a child from his or her parents only when necessary. I think ultimately it should be best interest of the child. That's obviously the most important piece. While we're following the law and the law says reunify with parents when you can, the majority of the time we're unable to do it. But that's not what the numbers show. We broke down this data that DCF sent to us and between 2008 and 2013 close to 50 percent of the kids whose parents come under investigation by DCF for abuse or otherwise end up back in the same home. There are very strong feelings on either side. The director of the University of New Hampshire's Crimes Against Children Research Center says that's the case across the country, but also says children that are there killed by an abuser were usually hurt care. before. Most child protection agencies bend over backwards to preserve the bond between parents and children if they possibly can. DCF Commissioner Dave Iacovone does say he needs more staff. Claims at DCF are up almost 20 percent between 2007 and 2012. This year, the agency is on track to hit more than 17,000 claims. That's roughly one claim every 30 minutes. If you talk to any child welfare commissioner in the nation, they'll all say, including me, I need more resources. The caseworker to claim ratio is improving, down from 1 to 20 to 1 to 16. But the legislature passed a law five years ago, pushing DCF to get that figure even lower. One caseworker to every 12 cases. It doesn't mandate it, but we know what best practice is. This is one of the last pictures that I had with her. Still, for Desiree's Aunt Patty, there's almost nothing that can bring closure. It will never heal. I have a hole in my heart. Uh, we understand this is very upsetting, it's very troubling, and this is really a priority uh, for not only this office, but I think the state of Vermont. While the death of a 15-month-old Winooski boy is still being looked into by the Chittenden Unit for Special Investigations, more details are coming to light, including that a social worker for the Department of Children and Families was present about an hour before Peyton Gerard's death. Still no one removed that child from the home and that investigator continues to work with Vermont's children. And for the first time tonight, we're hearing from those who knew the young victim and are demanding better. It's hard to think about what happened to him. Stephanie Bilodeau got to see Peyton Gerard grow up. He was in her son's daycare class for the past year. He was really cute. But as she looks through old pictures, she's left with more questions than answers. I, I just want <laughs> justice for, for him. I think that that's extremely in, important right now, and I think that... Um, somebody needs to, you know, speak out on his behalf. According to court records, the 14-month-old was brought to Fletcher Allen at the beginning of April. He was throwing up and had a fever. Hospital staff noticed bruising on Peyton's neck. When they asked the boy's mother, Natasha LaForce, and her boyfriend, Tyler Shacoin, about the bruises, neither could explain how Peyton got them. The toddler was sent home and died two days later, a little over an hour after a DCF worker visited the sleeping baby. His death was eventually ruled a homicide. He, he was standing right over him. I, I think that he could have been a lifesaver. Vermont state policy prevents a DCF caseworker from immediately removing a child from the home, but police could have been called in. Sometimes a caseworker might be accompanied by a police officer. The police officers do have that authority. And oftentimes they might be there alone and it's a judgment call. And depending on the whole situation would dictate how they act. Whenever we lose a vulnerable child, uh, we're all responsible, and it is absolutely heartbreaking. And while Governor Shumlin waits for the findings of the investigation by lawmakers and an independent one into Peyton's death, the caseworker who visited the little boy shortly before he died is still working at DCF. Why not put the caseworker on leave like you would a police officer if there was a shooting or something like that until, until you get all the answers and until you find out if there was any wrongdoing? Again, I can assure you that we should be very careful about casting blame or suggesting that we think we have answers uh, when we probably don't yet. Tonight, more questions about Peyton Girard's death. 
Those who knew the young victim wonder if the hospital did enough to help the Winooski toddler. According to court documents police filed, Peyton visited Fletcher Allen Healthcare two days before his death. Medical staff observed bruises on each side of Peyton's neck. When asked, neither Peyton's mother, Natasha LaForce, nor her boyfriend, Tyler Shacoin, could explain how Peyton received the bruising on his neck. Doctors also told investigators the child was being treated for throwing up, a fever, and malaise, which means being generally out of sorts. Would a suspicious situation like that where there's bruising on a neck, which isn't a normal injury that a young child would have, um, and th the combination of the parents having no explanation for that, would that be enough to warrant maybe more testing to see if there are other injuries that aren't visible? I see it as two separate questions. There's a question of, does this injury that you're seeing in front of you make you worried potentially about child abuse? That's one question the provider needs to deal with. And then based on the exam that you're doing on this person right now, in your expert opinion, are there other injuries you're worried about managing right now? But it's all a judgment call, right? Exactly. Jennifer Pullman is the executive director of the Vermont Children's Alliance, and she points out medical professionals in the state of Vermont are not required to go through any training when it comes to identifying child abuse. Uh, we need to provide more support and training for our medical professionals, and we also need, you know, in terms of find, helping them to identify symptoms and signs of abuse. Although Fletcher Allen employees are not required to by the state, they do go through child abuse training every two years. Police have not charged anyone in connection with Peyton's death, although LaForce and her boyfriend are both in custody on parole and probation violations respectively. That's unrelated to Peyton's death. And tonight his death is raising questions about the authority DCF caseworkers have in Vermont. And advocates are pushing for change. I mean, I, th I think it's horrible. Pullman wants to see immediate changes to the authority DCF caseworkers have in Vermont. In Peyton's case, he was visited by a caseworker about an hour before his death. As Vermont law stands right now, even if that caseworker had wanted to remove Peyton from the home, he couldn't have without first getting approval from a judge or calling in police. It is on call, but still, um, you know, an hour, two hours, three hours, what, you know, what is that level of risk to the child in that case? But even in the instance of, of calling like a judge who might be on call or, or calling in police, I mean, that's going to take a little bit of time, right? Well, sure, it can. It certainly can. But usually people are quite responsive. Caseworkers in New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut all have the power to immediately remove a child from a home if they believe that child is in danger. But in New Hampshire, like Vermont, caseworkers don't have that authority. And it's something DCF Commissioner Dave Iacovone doesn't think is necessary. But why not just take the child out, put him in a neutral situation, and then, and then assess it rather than, you know, wait for somebody else to give permission to do that? Well, it can be, depending on the age of the child, incredibly traumatic for a child when that happens. So it's never taken lightly. I'd like to think that if we give our social workers more discretion, more tools, that we're going to result, that we're going to have improved outcomes for children. Now in 2008, state lawmakers passed a resolution recommending the state agency work at a ratio of one caseworker per every 12 cases. But as we told you, that's not what's happening. At the time of our report, there was one caseworker for every 16 cases. But now, because of a growing number of claims, that ratio now stands at 1 to 17. Governor Peter Shumlin doesn't want to waste any more time. These are structural changes that I think cannot wait to ensure that we're protecting our most vulnerable children. He's taking action before we know what exactly happened in the deaths of two-year-old Desiree Sheldon and 14-month-old Peyton Jira. I think we can make change immediately, even before we know what happened in these specific cases. And that means hiring more staff right away, 18 additional caseworkers. Why is that important? Because the number of complaints of abuse for Vermont's children has doubled in the last five years. It's something DCF Commissioner Dave Iacovone told WPTZ he needed last week. If you don't have the resources to do that work, and to protect them when they need it, you can, it doesn't matter, you can have the best policies in the world. Shumlin also wants all of those caseworkers to receive target training, especially for when they're dealing with young children like Peyton and Desiree, who can't communicate effectively. On top of that, he's calling for DCF to narrow its focus back to its core mission of protecting children. And he's ordering that all serious physical abuse cases head through DCF's central office. But what the governor won't be doing is drawing conclusions about how two young children could die after having contact with a state agency designed to protect them. I think it's really important that we not sit there and make judgments about what went wrong until we have the independent reports.
Now, the governor has given the Health and Human Services Secretary, Doug Racine, until August 1st to produce a reorganization plan for DCF. The mother of Peyton Giroir charged with killing her son. After looking into Peyton Giroir's death for five plus weeks, police believe they're getting closer to figuring out what happened. <laughs> Peyton's mother, 28-year-old Natasha LaForce, appeared in court Wednesday, pleading not guilty to a second-degree murder charge in the death of the 14-month-old. Please understand that we're not investigating the deaths of Desiree Sheldon or Peyton Giro. This is a job for law enforcement, and we cannot interfere with those investigations. In front of an audience of about 50 and a panel full of state representatives and senators, the first child abuse hearing in Chester got underway. If this is about safety and making sure these kids are okay, we're failing. Zella Sheldon quietly took it all in. It was her great-granddaughter, Desiree Sheldon's death, that helped spark the conversation about child abuse. I know we can't bring it back, but I'm glad that something that something's going to come with this anyway. Something's going to help somebody else. Desiree's stepfather, Dennis Doobie, pleaded not guilty to her murder. Her great-grandmother didn't want to speak during the hearing. But afterwards, she told WPTZ the state of Vermont should have done more to protect her great-granddaughter. Desiree should still be here. A serious little girl. I can't imagine how anybody would even abuse her. The calls for change took all forms. More rights for grandparents, changes to the judicial system, and better training for medical professionals. The Agency of Human Services oversees DCF, and for the first time tonight, we're hearing from the head of that agency, Secretary Doug Racine. Uh, when something like this happens, when we have two homicides, and let's not forget they are homicides, uh, we have to look at our system and say, are there things out there that we could have done better? Are there things out there that uh, we really need to address that we haven't looked at in a few years? A woman is talking specifically in rural areas that doctors have trouble uh, recognizing child abuse when they see it. We could be looking at that, and I think we should be looking at that. And if that issue is coming up, uh, then yes, we need to go back and, and, and address it. Racine says there are other changes, too, already in the works. More staffing and a change in policy when it comes to how DCF handles serious cases of child abuse. He says those things will address some of the concerns raised at the meetings in Chester, Manchester, and Rutland on Tuesday. It's more information, it's more feedback. Uh, but I'm hearing some things that we already are aware of. As to that underlying theme repeatedly heard at all three meetings, questions about family reunification. State policy in Vermont suggests DCF employees reunite children with their families if it's safe to do so. But many said unfit parents are being given too many chances. She had had five other children that had been removed from her custody, yet she was allowed a chance with this baby. And the child's part of a family. You know, sometimes the reports are talking about, well, the child versus the family. The child's part of the family. I'm outside of the O'Brien Community Center in Winooski on Mallets Bay Avenue here. Very crowded in that hearing earlier today. We'll get you more details on that in just a moment. But there's another independent panel that's looking into the deaths of Desiree Sheldon and Peyton Jira. Now, despite calls from the governor to speed that process up, the whole committee, which is 23 people, has yet to meet in person. I spoke with a committee co-chair earlier this week, and he tells me that they have had some online exchanges and some conference calls and says the whole process is pretty complicated. I would have seen, felt it unreasonable for me or, or uh, members of, of VCAB to suggest that we go faster. VCAB co-chair and pediatrician Dr. Joe Hagan believes the board investigating the deaths of Desiree Sheldon and Peyton Jira, which is composed of Vermont yeah. Citizens Advisory yeah. members yeah. and special appointees, is working as quickly as they can. We have had um, uh, a, a, a very definite plan of action and our own timeline that's we just were been been waiting to flip the switch. Hagan says part of the delay uh, is a matter of process. Too. The board waits for Vermont State Police to finish its investigation before starting their own. But as Hagan said, state police wrapped up three or four weeks ago. And at this point, several board members have not seen the documents regarding Desiree's death. And they do not have the Peyton documents either. Remember too, these are highly privileged documents. We're talking about medical records, we're talking about social service records. We're talking about court records. We're talking about the things that everyone holds uh, as, uh, as very private. Still, and around the so same time Hagan got word VSP really was wrapping up, the governor sent a letter to Dr. Hagan urging the board to complete the job swiftly. That is not correct. I'm not sure uh, what you're uh, alluding to. Um, the governor didn't tell us to hurry up. 
The governor said, no, you may go ahead. He did ask you to hurry up. He says, I write to you today to urge the board to meet as regularly and as expeditiously as possible to review both of these deaths. And he's come out and said this at a press conference as well, that he asked you to speed things up. My interpretation was, now you may start, and I hope that you will do this with thoroughness and with alacrity. WPTZ also wanted to ask Dr. Hagen about the composition of this board. 23 members from various backgrounds, including law enforcement, children's advocates, a foster parent, and parents. We noticed all five of the medical professionals on the board, including Dr. Hagen, are affiliated with Fletcher Allen Healthcare. At least one children's advocate has raised questions about the medical center and if it could have done more to protect Peyton at a hospital visit just two days before his death. What about bias? You worry about that? Uh, I don't. I mean, I, I'm a pediatrician. I uh, have practiced in this community for almost 40 years. But Hagen says he won't remove anyone from the board. Rather, another board member will offer yeah, checks and balances. But you bring up a good point. I'll, I'll have to ask one of my non-physician colleagues to take special attention to that. No mention of any of those toddlers at today's hearing. In fact, lawmakers asked people to focus on their own problems within the system. And time and time again, an issue that came up was lack of communications. People told story after story about failed communication, failing to protect the children in their lives. There's been at least 20 complaints to DCF. Repeated phone calls to Vermont's Department for Children and Families. Call in, call in, call in. That you just call in. I call in like 10 reports on a family, 20 reports about a child who's in, is struggling in this horrible condition and they just sit there. Stories of abuse continually relate to the state, but some say their information never goes anywhere. You people have to start doing something about it. We are seeing the same themes over and over again. Perhaps the most pressing issue is communication, whether it's within the DCF system or with the judicial system, children's advocates and family members. That we really have to take a look at the, um, the uh, how we share information right now. It's kept confidential. We need to make sure that we have all of the people there when we're deciding what's going to happen to a kid. Well, that's right, George. No charges against anyone involved in that child abuse investigation concerning Desiree Sheldon. That includes DCF caseworkers, the Rutland Police Department, and the Rutland County State's Attorney's Office. Attorney General Bill Sorrell said in a statement, there was no evidence that any of the state or local employees involved in the case were acting in a manner contrary to what they thought was in the best interests of Desiree Sheldon at the time. In court today, Tyler Shacoin admitted he didn't tell police what he says really happened the day Peyton died until weeks into the investigation. I'm happy that, you know, he now spoke up, but I wish that he would have did it on, like, the day he was asked instead of, you know, three, four interviews of still lying. Tyler Shequin's mother and sister sat quietly behind him while he admitted in open court he knowingly withheld information from police. Guilty. 14-month-old Peyton Gira died on April 4th, but police say it wasn't until May that Shequin would tell the whole story about what he says happened the day Peyton died. He said clearly and demonstrated that he saw Natasha LaForce violently shake Peyton Gira and, and slammed Peyton Gira's head against the floor in the house. That account was corroborated by the medical examiner as the likely cause of death. According to the affidavit, Shequin spoke to officers four times, but it wasn't until he was polygraphed in the third and fourth interviews that he began to reveal the details about Natasha LaForce, saying he had never seen her this crazy and violent before, adding she was definitely on something and it wasn't just weed. And it was like she wasn't there. If Tyler had been honest about what he saw sooner, do you think Peyton might still be alive? You know, I can't answer that uh, question um, at, at this time. I mean, clearly, um, because of Ms. Mr. Shequin's uh, earlier statements to the police, this investigation was delayed. And while Shequin prepares to be the prosecution's primary witness in the murder trial against his former girlfriend, his family is still healing. And it's still hard, and it'll probably still be hard for probably the rest of my life, you know? The Department for Children and Families is cleared of any wrongdoing in the death of Odenuski baby. Chittenden County State's Attorney T.J. Donovan says no DCF workers will be charged in the death of 14-month-old Peyton Gerald. I'm very gratified that, to have this outcome of this investigation. Um, this has been 
extremely difficult for um, our department and our social workers who are carrying a, a great weight every day, quite frankly. Did he conduct the, the, the examination, the physical examination, that is <coughs> consistent with the, his department's protocols? He did. Because of that, there is no criminal charge. Governor Shumlin asked the Secretary of Human Services to resign. The governor would not talk specifically about why he asked Doug Racine to leave human services, nor would he confirm that he even asked Racine to step down. Although later, his deputy chief of staff did tell us he did, in fact, ask Racine to leave. Now, what the governor would say today is that the largest agency in the state needed new leadership. At a news conference on an entirely different subject, Governor Peter Shumlin clearly came prepared to talk about the shakeup at the Agency of Human Services. Sure, I think I have the incoming secretary with me. Harry Chen, you're welcome to come up. With the interim secretary at his side, Shumlin said he thought Secretary Doug Racine needed to be replaced by Chen, who's Vermont's health commissioner. As governor, these decisions are never easy but I felt that it was time for a different kind of leadership. We wanted to know, why change leadership now? You know, I'm not going to talk a lot about why now or uh, uh, look, look at the past. I have to make a judgment as governor when I feel that an agency needs new leadership. I made that judgment. And when we asked specifically if Racine's resignation is related to the problems within DCF? Absolutely not. And I want to be clear, uh, I'm not going to focus on the past. We begin with Dave Iacovoni stepping down as head of Vermont's Department for Children and Families. Iacovoni has been under scrutiny following the deaths of at least two children who were being monitored by DCF. Let me be clear about this. This is my choice. I believe in service. Um, it hasn't been easy, but these jobs, none of them really are. But I'm not running from anything. Dr. Harry Chen, the new secretary in charge at the Human Services Agency, releasing his recommendations for reform of DCF. On Wednesday, Chen delivered his report to the governor with five things he wants to change. Better collaboration with other state agencies uh, and community partners, including the use of collaborative teams and multidisciplinary teams in a more intentional way. Uh, increased transparency and communication, both internally um, and within the department, and with its partners, uh, including the legislature and the public at large. Chen and the new DCF commissioner, Ken Schatz, also recommend hiring more staff at the 1,200-person department, mostly frontline workers who deal with at-risk children and their families. And he wants better training for social workers who handle difficult cases involving addiction. But Chen rejected calls to divide DCF into a separate agency. We concluded that DCF should strengthen operational, well, strengthen its approach to integrated services rather than engage in major reorganizations aimed at splitting up the agency. In Montpelier, reaction was mixed. And every one of these problems, the answer is always hire more people. So that's a concern to me. Uh, are we concerned about the issue at DCF? Absolutely. Uh, we people should not fear for children's lives in Vermont. Governor Shumlin asked for the report and likes what he sees but he could not say if it would have changed what happened in the cases involving Peyton and Desiree. Because I just don't know. Nobody knows. This is what we do know. Our kids are under assault by opiate addiction. The kids are the victims of addiction. And we're dealing with more of it. We're battling that as best we can. But we've got to increase the odds of success in really, really difficult situations. The workers are doing, the state workers are doing a great job. I think the infrastructure is doing a great job, but we've got to do better. When these uh, horrible events occurred, we did want, uh, commit ourselves to reflection. The result, a 30-page report investigating the state's handling of the cases of Desiree Sheldon and Peyton Giraud, who died while under state supervision. Child safety is a community problem, um, and the whole community has to address it. The scathing report says not only did DCF employees not follow proper procedure, but the policies and procedures throughout the system were not adequate. Regarding the death of two-year-old Desiree, the report says some of the information and red flags which may have influenced the case planning were missed. Though at Friday's news conference, the board seemed to play down the severity of the report. We found no wrongdoing 
as did other uh, reviewers. What we found were opportunities to do things uh, more efficiently, more effectively. The board did outline a number of areas of improvement, including reassessing the importance of reuniting children with their biological parents, improving communication and information sharing between state agencies in the cases, and addressing the ratio of cases to staff. But at the core of many of these improvements is funding. Where we're going to have to um, certainly lay the priorities on the table and uh, have an honest discussion about where we want to put our dollars, the limited dollars.